ultimately, if we can be relaxed, we're going to make better decisions. We're going to treat others with more respect and we're going to be nicer to the people we love. And that's the goal, right? That's the, that's that right there is, is winning. I guess, Jesse, tell me, uh, how'd you get into all this stuff? How'd you get into sort of personal development, trying different things, trying to be the best and healthy version of yourself you could be? Yeah, because this is the opposite of how I lived my entire life, actually, up until about probably about the age of 30. I, uh, I really was a late bloomer, I guess, when it comes to caring about how I feel. And I, I guess technically I cared a lot about how I felt, but I was really confused as to what was going on. And so most of my life, I did the exact opposite of everything you're supposed to do. <laughs> I uh, didn't exercise. I ate wrong. I, I was really, really kind of... I always had a problem with social anxiety. So I'm, I'm an extreme extrovert, uh, as you probably already can tell, uh, but I have always had social anxiety. So uh, this is a kind of a, a weird combination to have. And so the thing that I really wanted to do was the thing that caused me the most anxiety. So I would do what so many of us do and I would find out you know, ways to kind of numb that. So I would, I would drink a lot. I, I was, uh, I got addicted to uh, opioid for 10 years of my life. And so I really, I really went down the wrong path. And it wasn't until I, um, I, I came to a point in my life where I was like, okay, uh, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, this is causing me a lot more pain than uh than it was helping because hey drugs and alcohol i will say they work at first <laughs> but uh but you know i i was like okay there's got to be something that i i need to to lean into and so i slowly got into exercise and um actually i remember the first time i went to exercise i was in grad school so i went back to grad school uh later on in life uh, to become an english professor so that's one of the jobs that i do and i was my roommate i remember he said one time hey uh you want to go why don't you get your gear and we'll go to the gym and i was I, I i honestly i was like is that something people do for fun do people actually go and exercise for enjoyment what yeah i couldn't fathom that and i'll never forget because i had to borrow his shoes i was so far removed from health and wellness that I had to borrow someone else's athletic shoes. So when we went to the gym, uh, I hated every second of it, but I realized there was something there. And so I started exercising more, trying to eat better, didn't really understand why these things that I, you know, it's funny, there's this stuff like pizza and cake and stuff that tastes so good, but for some reason it's bad, you know? And then there's, this other stuff, you know, the broccoli and lean proteins and things, you know, it tastes quite as good, but they're somehow good for you. I just didn't understand any of that. And so slowly but surely I got into understanding it more and really detoxed from the other person I was. But then I got into, I tried to, a, a friend of mine introduced me to the concept of meditation. And I found out very quickly that I was terrible at meditation. <laughs> my mind just it would uh it would wander and you know i always my joke for about meditation is always that it's the easiest thing in the world to do you just sit there and you don't think about anything right and and obviously you know that's a very difficult thing to do but i um i at that point i started researching ways to meditate better and that's when i stumbled upon breath work and from there uh, I was hooked on, wow, there's so many ways to feel better and to be, you know, improve my focus and, uh, my performance and every other element of life. And wow, my anxiety that I used to have to feel like I had to, you know, take drugs and then really have to really medicate. It's amazing how I can, I, I don't feel so, so, you know, anxious and nervous and things. And I, and I have a, a tool I've had. And, and then basically I just, I realized there are tools out there if we're willing to use them and we're willing to learn them. 
So I, I'm an example of a person who started out for the first 30 years of life completely on a different path. And I, I'm now 41 uh, and I'm way healthier than I was <laughs> when I was 30. <laughs> I, I'm actually, in a way, I feel like I'm aging in reverse. That's amazing. Talking about breath work, I'd love to share my experience with breath work and I'd love to get your thoughts yeah. on it and then and dig into that. Sure. So, you know, I've always been doing cold showers every morning and then my experience with cold showers has changed from initially trying to just go hard at it and just get it over and done with to learn it to embrace the pain and feel it to taking deep breaths in and out and, and, and trying different things. Um, now it's at a point where I'm like trying to really breathe in the coldness and I could feel my pores open and I'm taking in, 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 in the coldness of the what I know sounds a bit weird. Um, but another thing I do is whenever I'm sort of nervous or jittery, I could take a deep breath and it sort of really calms me down. It's sort of, I feel like a bit high in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And another thing I've been doing lately is whenever I feel like a pain of like procrastination, fear, um, pushing things aside, I could sort of take a deep breath in and, and put all that emotions and sort of push it out of me. Um, so I'm saying all these random things um, as a segue to, to your, your sort of um, world within in, in the breath work world, yeah. Well, and so much of the time when we have anxiety or whenever you're, you know, you're feeling this stress, so much of the time we, we will try to suppress that instead of trying to, to lean into it. It's a lot like your cold shower experience, you know, um, and you know, so much of the time we get into an uncomfortable situation, whether it's on purpose, you know, we get in a cold shower, it's, you know, that's the nice thing about a cold shower. We know worst case scenario, I can turn it off if, if I really have to, but that's not how life works, right? You, you go out into life and somebody is being a jerk and you just kind of, you know, you got to put up with it or, or figure out how to escape. But problem is you can't escape always. Right. And, and so we have to learn how to deal with the stresses of life. And one of the things that people always tell us, right? They always say, hey, you should live in the moment, be present in the moment, right? And they never seem to want to let us know how that works. But here's the big secret. When you're present with your breath, when you take a moment to reset with your breath, that's being present in the moment. That's resetting your focus. That's focusing on something very immediate. This breath that I'm taking right now, it's literally just right now. You know, in our, when it comes to anxiety, you know, so much of anxiety is about things that are not in the now, right? So, so there was a, a, a philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard, and he, he once said that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. And, you know, if you think about that, what he was, he was talking about, you know, no matter what we do, we have a lot of choices, but what am I going to do? Right? And it's kind of discombobulating and it causes us all kinds of anxiety. What am I going to do here at this moment? I could do this, I could do that, but what if I do that and I regret it? Or what if I do this and I regret it? Or, you know, there's always so many choices and it causes us all sorts of anxiety. And sometimes it really is important to come back into the moment we live in right now, because that's all we really have. <sighs> you know, just really take a deep breath and reset. And that allows us a lot of times to still our emotions enough to lean into the moment that we have and to make the decision as best as we possibly can, because there's no way we can know everything, but ultimately we can make the best possible decision with some confidence because we know, you know, there's going to be such a thing as discomfort and whether it's in a cold shower or whether it's in life, you know, we can lean into that. And a lot of times in, in the breathwork world and, and also the cold training and um, that, that kind of world, we say we surrender to the moment and we just decide to just be open to whatever it is that it has to give us. That's beautiful. Yeah, because I do notice I've been sort of subconsciously sort of using breathing as a tool to reset and sort of help me in life. Is there like a sort of exercise or daily ritual that you sort of use 
um, to really get good at it or even be more aware of it? Yeah, and so there are a lot of techniques and in the world of breath work, there's, it's, it's actually interesting. There, uh, there's so many techniques that sometimes a person says, well, my technique is the best one. And, oh, you know, no, nope, that one's not the best one. This one over here is. And, and what I found in my practice, and I've been doing this a while now, uh, I published a book about it and I'm working on my next book on breath work. And it's, uh, I, I've got a course called The Language of Breath. And but ultimately, when it comes down to it, we are never living the same day twice. And, and sometimes we feel like we are. You know, oh man, I get up, I go to work, I come home, I, I watch TV, I go to bed, you know. And in, in some respects, okay, we live the same day twice in, in that way. But it, in reality, it's not necessarily like a Groundhog's Day thing. Let's, let's hope not. In reality, we have an infinite number of emotions filter through our psychology all throughout the day. And it's interesting because if you think about it, who you are when you wake up, and we know this to a certain degree, like our, our emotional state changes, right? So man, who I am when I wake up is different slightly. I mean, I'm still Jesse Coomer, right? But who I am when I wake up is slightly different than who I am before lunch, during lunch, after lunch, who I wake up, you know, who I am after lunch is slightly different than who I am right now. And for, for me, where I am right now, it's the evening. It's a little after 8 PM. And so while I'm still me, we have, a lot of variation in how we feel and, and a lot of variation in how feelings feel. So to say that there are some, some rituals to do, yes, absolutely. There are some that I'm going to recommend tonight, but I do want to emphasize the value of what you are already doing. So, so, so you're already doing something that a lot of times I have to really struggle to get clients to understand. And that is that, when you do breath work, a lot of times a person will believe, well, if I do a morning routine, I'm set the rest of the day. Every other breath I take doesn't really matter because I did this cool routine in the beginning. It's almost like a magic ritual. And then I am set for the rest of the day. And, and people don't, we don't come out and say this, but, but I think there's, there's a certain understanding of like, well, I do do my breath work in the morning and then I'm set. And I do my breath work in the morning. I do. And I'll do certain breath, breath work techniques later on in the day. But ultimately, it's in the moment that we really need the tool. You know, you can do all the prep work, you can do all the breath work you want before, you know, someone says something that irritates you or before, you know, a loved one dies or you almost get, you know, ran over, or, you know, in traffic or something like that. It's what happens in that moment is ultimately sometimes the most important breath work you're going to do all day. So I want to give you some tools for in that moment. Um, now, if, if you want to check out, I've got a whole book, a practical guide to breath work. It's on Amazon and all that good stuff. You can go to my website, take a look at the links, right? <laughs> Show notes, but I'm going to go over a few of the techniques that I recommend to a wide variety of people. And these are techniques that I have taught uh, the United States military, uh, police forces from uh, in the, here, in, especially in, in the state of Indiana, where I live, um, drug rehab clinics. I go a lot of different places and, and teach a lot of different people. But the thing is, ultimately, we all have moments when we need to use the tools. So the first tool I want to just introduce you to is a very simple one. And it actually has a lot to do with whatever, what you actually mentioned, you naturally have an inclination to do. And that is taking a deep breath. Now, to take a deep breath is that there's a certain art to that. So I'm going to teach you how to take a deep breath. Okay, so here today, we're going to learn how to take a deep breath. So a lot of times when we say take a deep breath, a lot of times we say that, but what we hear is take a big breath and they're a little bit different. Okay, so a deep breath means where we put the breath. So here's what we're going to do. All right. So for those people listening and for everybody, uh, just if, if you're if you're driving, I'm sorry. You can do this whenever you're, you're not driving, but what you're going to do is you're going to find your belly button. So, so with your finger, go ahead and find your belly button and then take your other hand and take two fingers and you're going to measure two fingers below your belly button. So we're just using our fingers as, as measuring tools here. Okay, good, good. Now you're going to save that new spot. So go down and put your 
your pointer finger, yeah, underneath those two fingers. And that is our new spot, right? So about two fingers below the belly button is the spot where I want you to think about. And then I want you to imagine that you could go three fingers. Now, for some of us, we might know who we are, right? Maybe we'll need four fingers. And then you'll know what I'm talking about here in a minute. But we're going to go three fingers for you, three, three fingers for you, my friend. And imagine you could go inside your abdomen at that point, three fingers deep. Okay. And what I want you to do is imagine a marble. So, so every time we inhale, we're going to turn that marble into a softball. Okay. Now that is a very specific point that we're going to focus that inhale. So when you're taking a deep breath, it needs to fill that space first before any of the other parts fill up. So before your ribs start to fill up, before your chest moves, you need to completely turn that marble into a softball. And then once that's into a softball, well, then you can start filling up the rest and you can go up from like the ribs and up to the chest. So what we're going to do right now, very simple, but simple doesn't necessarily mean it's not important. Okay. Sometimes the most important things are the simple things we overlook. We're going to take a deep breath. And when we exhale, we're going to lengthen our exhale. So it's going to look a little something like this. Okay. So, so for, for those of you who, guys who are just listening, I'm going to maybe put my, I'll inhale through the nose. I'll give you a little nose service on the, um, on my microphone here. So we're going to breathe deeply in all the way in. So we have a nice full lung, but we've, we've expanded that lower part first, right? So we have a nice full lung and then we're going to exhale and we're going to purse our lips just, just so we can all be on the same page. We're going to purse our lips and we're, we're going to pretend we're breathing out through a straw. So. And if you can go as long as you can go, that is, that is an actual technique. Now I call it the soldier's technique. Uh, this is a, a technique that, um, in, in fact, when I teach this technique, it's really very handy. There was a movie that came out, I think it was just a couple of years ago called 1917. And it was this really neat movie. It's all one take and it's about World War I. And uh, I was watching it. I like to watch action movies. And uh, there was this part where this soldier in the movie actually does what I always call the soldier's routine. So I'm like, oh, cool! I can show this. So, so if if you were if you wonder what this looks like in a in an action situation, you can go on YouTube and you can find you you just type in um, what is it, uh, 1917 river crossing scene, and it's in there. But basically, what we're doing is we're breathing in all the way in through our nose, and and again, we're breathing down deep, not just a big breath but also a deep breath. So deep down in our abdomen, filling that up first. And then we're exhaling nice and slow, as slow as you can. Now, when you're in a freak out moment, if you're in a really intense moment, yeah, you're not gonna be as slow as if, like for instance, right now we're relaxed, we're just hanging out. So we can slow it down quite a bit. Now, what this does, okay? So, so just a little background on, on, I know it's a simple, simple technique, but what this does, is it will stimulate your vagus nerve. So there's a, there's a nerve that connects almost every organ in your body and, and it innervates. And, and when, we, when we stimulate that, it is a signaler to our autonomic nervous system. So, so our conscious self, of course, is the part of us that understands the language we're speaking to each other. And it, you know we set up a time to talk today and when we know what our favorite uh, podcast is, but every other part of us is the unconscious self and it's trying to survive. That's all it knows how to do. Just trying to just staying alive, right? BGs. So <laughs> whenever, whenever it, it picks up some kind of a distress and, or it's, it's, it's afraid we can, we have to speak to it. We have to speak to our other half, if you will. So when we do this, we lengthen the exhale and that'll stimulate part of us. That's called the vagus nerve. And it sends signals all throughout the body to relax. Okay, so so nice deep, and you can you can repeat this over and over again and lengthen the exhale more and more every time as you start to relax a little bit. Okay. 
And what you'll find is that eventually, if you practice this enough, there's a lot of times um, I'll, I'll, you know, a person will be able to make that exhale go for 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds, maybe a minute, even if you're really relaxed. And so that technique you can take with you everywhere. It doesn't mean you, you know, there's a lot of techniques that you just have to sit down. You have to make sure you have 15 minutes to practice, but that's a technique that you carry in your pocket. It's free and it's, it's going to help you stay focused whenever things get tense. There's another technique that is really, it's probably the most prescribed technique out there. And it's, and whenever you have something that's very popular, people are like, oh, I've heard of this one before. I don't really care. But here's the thing guys. Okay. Before you, before you bash something that is popular, just know that usually something that's popular is popular because it works. And this one is called box breathing. Now, many people have heard of box breathing. Some people have not. This is a very common one when I train military, when I train police, when I train MMA fighters, um, anybody that's about to go into a tense situation. Now, this is something that I, I, I mentioned all of those, you know, intense physical danger, you know, groups, but you don't have to be going into physical, you know, a physically dangerous situation in order to have all of those same stress hormones, all of the same, you know, psychological fears and anxieties, right? Because, you know, the same fear and, and anxiety that a person might feel going into a, a combat situation, you know, if you look at the, the, you know, all the chemicals and the hormonal profile, maybe you've got an algebra test you're studying for and you're really freaked out, right? So just because it's not life or death doesn't mean you don't get benefits from using this sort of thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to practice this and, and box breathing is called box breathing because there's four parts to the breath. We inhale for four seconds. We hold with a full lung for four seconds. Then we exhale for four seconds. And then we hold our breath for four seconds with what we might consider in not necessarily an empty lung, but a, um, what we might consider a, a neutral lung. So not completely empty, but still got maybe just a little bit of air. It's not full. And we repeat that pattern. Now, people can repeat this pattern for hours because, for instance, if you're in a, in a pre-combat situation where maybe you're making a patrol and you're kind of freaked out or maybe you're going on a call, maybe you're an ambulance driver or a firefighter and you just, you, you're freaking out and you want to bring yourself back into equilibrium because you know you've got to be the guy who's focused on that scene. Well, okay, this is what, what you want to use. So here, let's, let's try this out. We're just going to do, let's just do one minute of this. All right. So first of all, just so we're on the same breath, let's, let's breathe in all together. Deep breath. And then just let it out nice and relaxed. Okay. And breathe in two, three, four, hold two, three, four, out two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, in, staying aware, four, hold, two, three, four, relax it out, two, three, four, hold with the neutral lung, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, relax it out, two, three, four, and go back into normal breathing. really calming like it's i'm like there's like a natural sort of serotonin a natural sort of release of stress it's like okay yeah and the nice thing about it is that it's not necessarily going to put you to sleep but it will balance your autonomic state so we have you know we've a lot of the times we've, we hear about being in the state of fight or flight and in that state we, we we would have a lot of adrenaline and a lot of stress hormones. 
And then there's also the state rest and digest. Now, when we're in extremely fight or flight or extremely rest and digest, uh, like for instance, you might be freaking out or you might be going to sleep, right? But what we can do with, especially with this particular technique is we can balance those states. So we stay somewhat relaxed while still being able to focus and, and, and not, you know, not being tired, you know, being functional. And ultimately, if we can be relaxed, we're going to make better decisions. We're going to treat others with more respect and we're going to be nicer to the people we love. And that's the goal, right? That's the, that's that right there is is winning. If you ask me, you know, making better decisions, especially if, if that's very difficult to do, if you are in a state of heightened arousal to the point where you literally are fight or flight. It, I mean, you either are running away, you know, I got to get out of the situation, or I've got to rip somebody's head off, you know. <laughs> you know, I, and, and those are, those are not, that, those are not good options when you are in charge or when you need to perform. And so often in this world today, we get into like, for instance, that algebra test, just think about that or, or, you know, any other kind of a situation where you need to use your brain. I think we've all been at least one time in our lives. So anxious, so nervous that our mind blanks. I think that's a real common thing. I know, you know, in my life, I would, especially with chemistry, that was my, that was my difficult one in high school. I get into chemistry class and man, I studied really hard, but I was so nervous that, oh, I can't think of anything. What, what, why did my mind go blank? And what happens is we're so aroused. We're so in that, that what we call the sympathetic dominant state of our autonomic nervous system that, uh, we're just not in the right state for creative thinking or recall or in that ah, go or no go state. One thing that you mentioned before about how every day is different and there's different versions of you. That's something I can totally relate with because every day I wake up feeling completely different. Like the previous day yesterday, I woke up with a really clear sort of head and I felt really focused, but this morning, I woke up, my head was cloudy. Um, I was a bit exhausted. I felt low energy. And it was really hard to sort of balance out. Obviously, I forced myself to get out of bed. I forced myself to do my morning routine. I'm taking deep breaths. I'm trying to absorb the universe's energy. Um, but do you have any tricks on how to go ahead and normalize all the different versions of yourself? Um, Maybe I should try that breathing technique we just learned every morning, but does it work when you just wake up and your head is foggy? So in reality, this is, this may be a bit philosophical, but uh, it's, it's impossible to completely feel the exact same way more than once. I, in my opinion that, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten a little bit of experience on this and I think it is the desire to control the way we feel that tends to lead us into um, it can lead us into destructive behaviors. And again, I have sadly enough experience on that uh, because I was trying to control the way I felt with using drugs. So, so there's a certain degree of yes. Okay. So I will say, having said that we can change the way we feel using our breath, but we should also understand that there is no magic pill that make you feel the same every day. And that there is value in looking at life through different lenses, I, I believe. Now, having said that, you know, I know what it is to get up and you kind of, oh man, I got to drag myself out of bed or, or, or like, or maybe, or different than that. It's like, man, I'm just not feeling that today. You know, um, for instance, I do a lot of YouTube and uh, we, we talked about that a minute ago. And there's a lot of days where, man, I could make videos all day. You know, I could just make a video after video and I wouldn't, and it just seems to come out and I, and I don't need a second take on anything. And man, and then today, just to be honest, today I was trying to make a video and it just wasn't happening, you know? And so there's a certain degree of, we can make some changes and I'll, I'll give you, a, a, you know, some, some techniques I'm going to throw at you here in a minute. So, but I do want to always preface because I think in the world of breath work, it's sad but I see a lot of my fellow breath workers, 
trying to sell breath work as a magic uh, trick uh, or as a drug, you know, that you can just get high on all the time. And yes, you can feel amazing doing breath work. So I'm not going to deny that. And what I'm going to show you, these next two things I'm going to show you, they feel really good. Okay. But um, I don't want people to think that breath work is, is a magic trick or that you'll suddenly no longer be a human being. In fact, I, in my, for my school of, of breath work, language of breath, um, the whole goal is to not control. The whole goal is to learn to trust your body and learn to trust yourself. So with that in mind, there's my preamble. Uh, but having said that, here are things to do to try to give yourself maybe a little bit more energy or to break through a funk because, because it is, a, you know, there are times where it's like, okay, I don't have to, I don't have to suffer. I can, I can change my state and that is okay to do. I just, I'm not going to look at it like, like a magic trick, but I'm going to change my state. So my, my favorite one is one called sniff, sniff, poo. So, uh, this is <laughs> kind of a fun name, but sniff, sniff, poo, um, is, is one where you're going to take two breaths and that's where the sniff sniff comes in because it's through your nose and then you're going to go poo. okay so that's the poo part all right so sniff sniff poo you're taking the first breath is about 70 percent of a full breath the second one you're just topping it off so Now, after you do that a little while, you're, you're going to start to feel kind of loosey-goosey. You're going to feel kind of good in the head, maybe even a little lightheaded. That's okay. But what this does, it gives you enough of a stimulus that you start to feel a little energy. And it's not the kind of nervous energy that we associate with like stimulants, like oh, caffeine or something like that. Nothing against coffee. All right. I'm not going to pick that fight. <laughs> but at the same time, it's nice to be able to say anywhere I am. No matter how run down I feel, I can influence how I feel, you know, and I know my body, it's going to, it's going to help me out. I know my, you know, that, that unconscious part of me is going to pick up signals and say, well, I guess I'm to perform. So I always like doing sniff, sniff, poo. This is one that you can do long periods of time. Now, the longer you do it, the more lightheaded and kind of euphoric you're going to feel. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so it's, so it's something you can do whenever, like, for instance, you can just do one or two. Okay. I'm going to make that phone call now. Maybe it's, maybe all you needed was two good ones, right? But maybe it's just, man, it's been a day or, you know, maybe you woke up and you're just like, man, I just don't feel like doing anything today. Well, treat yourself a little bit. And the nice thing is it feels good and it's really good for you. It's opening up your lungs. It helps you get your blood working. It helps you actually it helps stimulate uh, your endocrine system. I mean, there's a lot of really positive things about it. But hey, if it only just felt good, that's fine too, right? That's okay too. Ah, there we go, you know, and and then there's another one that I like to do. Now, this one is one that I tend to do more often if I'm just, you know, I'm here in the Midwestern part of the United States. And um, I don't know where, where, you know, where you are. I'm not sure where uh, or how, how the weather is right now, but it's kind of in, in the pre, we're technically in the spring season, but it's, it's not really the green prettiness that everybody likes about spring. It's very cloudy. It, it rains. It's kind of yucky outside each day. And it's enough to kind of make you feel a little depressed. So you may not want to do sniff, sniff, poo when you're driving around and you're looking around wishing a sun ray would fall out of the sky. But you can do this other one that I call the cadence of bliss. And it's, it's called the cadence of bliss in, in my school of thought, but it's also widely known as four, seven, eight breathing. Now, four, seven, eight breathing 
is, uh, is, is basically, we're gonna inhale for four seconds, okay? So it's timed. We inhale for four seconds. And when we do this particular breathing technique, we really wanna force, uh, focus on expanding our ribs. So we're gonna breathe down into that marble, turning the marble into a softball, right? And then once it turns into a softball, we expand our ribs as much as we possibly can, really open up. So whenever you get to four, right, we're gonna go one, two, three, four. When we get to four, we need to be as expanded and as full of air as possible. Yeah, exactly. You just, I mean, imagine your ribs are wings and they got a flap and they're just going out. And so we're gonna get all the way up to four, expand it as much as we can. And then we're gonna hold our breath for seven seconds. And then after seven seconds, we're gonna relax our breath out uh, and we're going to lengthen the exhale for eight seconds. So inhale for four, really, really big expansion. Hold for seven with a nice full lung, maybe even a smile. And then we relax it out for eight seconds. And we're only going to do it four times because this is a pretty powerful one. You only really need four times. All right. So get ready. <sighs> nice and comfortable in your chair. And just feel good. All right. So Take a quick minute before, before we even get started to just kind of check in with how you feel right now, you know, in, in the, in the school of language of breath. And that's, that's ultimately the, the school that I teach. We, we say that awareness is the foundation of all positive change. We don't know what we need. We don't know literally how we are or where we are if we're not aware. So we just really want to become aware of how we feel. Okay, so let's take a deep breath in. So we're all in the same breath. Then relax it out. All right, now we're going to breathe in. Two. Expanding the ribs. Four. Hold. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Relax it out. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. Once again, in, two, three, expand, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, relax it out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Deep breath in, two, Three, full as we go. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, relax it out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Last one, deep breath in, all the way in. Four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, relax it out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now go back into normal breathing and just check back in with yourself. How do you feel? I see a big smile on your face. Yeah. So prior, my head was a bit heavy. Um, head wise, my brain felt like I was just tired, been working a lot. And then now I feel like a, it, it felt high. I feel that there's a bit of serotonin and there's a bit of like my head no longer, like it's a bit like i don't feel that heaviness it's like gone for a bit and, and i feel more aware my eyes are more awake and, and yeah I, I feel like switched on well and here's the beautiful thing about this this is one of these kind of a interesting techniques because it can be used for kind of almost anything you're looking for so I use this a lot of times whenever, like I said, I, I need a pick me up. I'm maybe it's a gloomy day and I just need to feel, I need something to make me feel better. Maybe I'm driving. I don't want to get super, you know, blissed out and, and I don't know, pass out or something, but I, I just need a little pick me up. But here's the funny thing. This technique also can be used if you need help going to sleep. So as, as awesome as you feel right now, as, as, as kind of turned on and, and just awake as we feel after we practice it during the daytime, if you practice this, if you lie down and you do four of these, you will likely be yawning by your third or fourth round. And it's an amazing thing because we're using the breath 
in a way that ultimately is going to rid you of anxiety, rid you of stress. And oftentimes when we're hanging on to stress and anxiety, it's more tiring than anything else. It's, it's hard to hold on to stress and anxiety actually is very, very tiring. So when we relax, it can help us have a pick me up, but it, it, it could also, of course, when we relax and we need to go to sleep, it works perfectly with our circadian rhythm. So one quick note on this is that four rounds is all you need. And I've often had people, you know, ask me because I don't always say why four. Uh, people will say, well, what if I do more than that? Well, if you do more than four, you die. I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so no, if you do, if you do, you can do up to eight. If you do more than eight, you tend to have a, just kind of a diminishing return after eight. So if you, if you really want to do more, so you can, you can go all the way up to eight, but then give yourself a minute or two of regular breathing and then go back and you do four to eight as you know, and that way it doesn't lose its effect. So, so those are three techniques that we've covered that are, if, a, if I could teach everyone those three techniques, the world would be a better place. We actually, we've, we've done a lot actually in this, in this session today, we've learned how to take a deep breath. First and foremost, most people don't know how to do that. They're breathing up in their chest and it makes them feel anxiety. We've learned what I call the soldier's technique, which is lengthening that exhale to bring us out of that heightened state of arousal. And then we've learned box breathing. Oh my God, we learned sniff, sniff, poo, and we learned, man. Went through a we, lot. We learned four, four techniques and how to breathe. Yeah. How cool is that? And what's your sort of ideal sort of success case study? Is it someone that then goes ahead and takes all these lessons you taught and they've sort of integrated into their daily lives and they're remembering to do it in times of toughness? Um, what's sort of your ideal sort of success? Yeah, well, I've trained people with all kinds of different issues uh, over the years. Um, we've had m actually multiple people who have had phobias um, needlessly, needlessly had suffered from phobias of driving or claustrophobia or other things like that. I've had uh, people with um, chronic indigestion, uh, panic attacks, you name it, really the full, full spectrum. And ultimately, um, the goal is so that you understand that your breath is as much of a part of your physiological regulation as your hands and feet, your eyes and ears. Um, we understand that, you know, if, if we're hungry, okay, we probably better find something to eat. Um, and, and we don't have to think, well, what technique is that, right? Or, you know, how many times do I do this? How many times do I do that? Ultimately, when you learn, uh, my school of, of, of breath work is, is language of breath. And when you learn that, ultimately it becomes really reflexive and you're not concerned necessarily about how many times I breathe this way. Yes, you know how, how long to inhale, you know how long to hold, you, you know how many times to do, again, that cadence of bliss we just did but it becomes part of your life in a way that it's not just routine. Routine is great. And I don't want to downplay the importance of routine because we all know that routine can produce amazing results, but routine is the first step. Eventually once you, and, and this, this goes for anything, eventually when you internalize what it is, whatever it is that you've, you've created a routine around you, you no longer even need that routine. It becomes just natural. And, and it just, you have a regular rhythm and flow. And because so often, you know, routine is a tool, it's a fantastic tool, but oftentimes we rely on a routine and it, and it inhibits us from really internalizing whatever it is we're doing. In this case, we're talking about breath work. Um, so many people come to me and they say, okay, so what time of day do I need to do this? Um, okay. So how many minutes do I do it? And that's great. And we start there. That's a great place to start. But any of my clients, if you work with me, or if you go through my courses or work with any of my instructors, you will, you'll find that eventually it's, it's, it's like you, it's like you develop your own Kung Fu of, of, of living. How do you get to that state where 
you're sort of, let's say you're running late, you're trying to catch a train, and the best thing for you is to take a deep breath and calm down for a bit, but since you have all this adrenaline running, you totally forget about all these lessons you've learned. How do you remember to do things when you're in a fragile state? That's where, that's where we, we graduate a person slowly because eventually once you internalize it, you're, you're breathing differently even whenever you're, like you're breathing differently from the average person uh, even whenever you're running, even whenever you're uh, freaking out, you consciously become aware of it. And it comes and it, it, it starts to become a reflex so that you're not even having to say, okay, so what is the right technique for, for me to do right now, right? You're not having to go through your Rolodex. You, you naturally are aware. And, and so I, I said earlier, one of the things that we say in language of breath is that awareness is the foundation of all positive change. The other things that we say is that your physiological self, right? So your unconscious you is just as much a part of you as just much you as anybody else. So it, sometimes I like to help a person visualize that. So whenever you're anxious, right? Whenever you're running late, freaking out, there's an intellectual part of you that, that is experiencing that. But you have to understand your unconscious you is also experiencing it. And it believes, hey, we're freaking out. We need to survive. There must be some predators, you know, of a bear that's going to come after us. And so ultimately we have to say, well, I am my own best team. And for me to operate at highest efficiency, I always need to be checking in with that. So I'm always listening to what my physiology is telling me. And I'm always having a conversation. And when you get into that mode, whenever you can have a conversation that is ongoing, and understand that no matter what, you are having that conversation. And I know that might sound a little esoteric. That might sound a little crazy. Eventually people you know, will understand this, but we're always having that conversation. And so whenever you're running late, whenever you're freaking out, as you're doing that, you're always aware, well, I, I know what it is to freak out. I know what anxiety is. And that is ultimately my unconscious self trying to avoid getting eaten or killed or and so if i understand that it's doing that because all of all of emotion has a physiological element so you in it you can't so whenever you're afraid you know you, your boss is going to kill you if you're late right you're on the bus and it's like, man, well, i barely made the bus and you know there's a certain degree of your physiology that believes that your boss is going to literally kill you <laughs> and so the better you are aware of, oh, my physiology is saying this. Oh, okay, I need to reinforce that it's okay. And of course, you know, there's only so much we can discuss in a podcast. This is where, um, you know, the, the first step is, is check out my book. The second big step um, I'll be coming out with my online course very soon. Actually, I was talking about that to you just a little bit ago. And I am going to listen to this episode because I'm very, very interested in uh, how to get it out there. But ultimately, um, you, we can learn how to always be in touch with that element of ourselves that's trying to survive. And you don't even have to. It's one of these things where you won't forget because you're always remembering. So I guess for the person that is listening, someone that, you know, they often get stuck on social media and it's really, when you're stuck, you, hours go by and then after four hours, then you get aware or you're eating Netflix, TV, YouTube, YouTube rabbit holes. Oh yeah. What's your piece of advice for them on how to gain that awareness or slowly work on that reflex? Because you look like you can be stuck on TikTok for hours and not be aware for hours. Yeah. Ultimately, I, I think there has to be a balance. You know, we're in a part of history that is the next kind of the next generation of how modernity is affecting us as a species. So, for instance, our species is programmed to seek out calories. So great, I need to survive. Okay, there's a deep survival instinct. And so it seeks out calories. It doesn't necessarily 
have programming in it to seek out calories as far as the quality of calories. It, it has certain mechanisms in it to say, okay, if it tastes like this, it probably is full of these nutrients or it is this macronutrient, which I need for my hormones, my brain, whatever, right? Now, the way it used to be in old and, you know, for most of human history, and I cover this deeply in my book, but I, I, I firmly believe this. The way it was for most of human history is that uh, you didn't really have to worry about harming yourself by eating too much, right? Our ancient ancestors, if they knew that today in the United States, 70% of people are either obese or overweight from eating too many calories, we're dying from eating too much. I, I think they would just, they wouldn't believe you, right? They would just say, no, that will never happen. That's just impossible. And the, what happened was between then and now is we've made calories so easy to come by but we don't internally have a filtering system that says, I'm only going to eat calories that are quality calories. We just eat whatever we, we eat whatever we have around, right? We eat whatever's expedient. So we have this thing called fast food. I mean, literally for that reason, we've seen how that's affected society. We've had to learn to develop a, our new palate. We, we, and, and if, if, if you're listening to this and you've gone through what I've gone through, I, I used to live off of, you know, pizza, ramen noodles, and ice cream, you know, actually side note, when I was an undergraduate, actually, I went two years of my life eating ice cream for breakfast every morning. Okay. And later on, there was this article, I'm sorry for, for getting off on, on the tangent, but there was this article that came out saying that ice cream was the ideal breakfast. Let me tell you, my friends, that's a lie. That is total garbage. You crash like within an hour or so, but it was so delicious, I just kept on doing it. But anyway, I can tell you that calories matter, the, the quality of the calorie matters. And we see how in the last 50 to 100 years, the abundance of calories has not produced a healthier individual. We're going through the same thing with information. You have to understand, and this even information was even harder to come by than calories for most of human history. So an information can be the difference between, you know, life or death. I mean, just think about the great deal of, of like when we think about Stonehenge, this is, I mean, think about how much effort was put into that, which is apparently just a, a very complex sundial that will tell us when to plant, right? Because that information was infinitely important. Now, like you said, we've got all this stuff that it's information, right? But we're doing the same thing we've been doing with food, right? Now, with food, we've started to realize this. And now there's, I, I see a revolution happening in the way that we treat our, our, our intake of food. But it's still very difficult, right? We have to be, we have to, we have to learn to develop a better palate. And it's the same thing with our information. We have to learn to redevelop our palate. Our palate will naturally, the natural way our, our brain works, is that it it seeks out information and any and, and the quickest way we can get the information is is what we're going to go for just like food so for instance and we've not to get into a, a deep you know rabbit hole here but uh our dopamine system encourages us to seek out new information that's what makes humans curious dopamine it says okay go look for new information now new information could be reading a book or it could be doing a science experiment or it could be you know figuring yourself out and really contemplating the universe or it could be looking at the latest trend on TikTok, right and the fastest way to get that dopamine to leave you alone because that's what we're trying to do the dopamine makes us do the thing <laughs> the fastest way to to satisfy that that dopamine is going to be what we tend to do so that's why we will go toward TikTok or YouTube or things like that. Now, having said that, I think we all understand that there's high value in these areas too. You, you know, I, you learn, there are some TikToks that are just really very educational and there's, you know, YouTube's, oh, mine is, is incredibly, I'm but well, I, it, I try, I try. But the point is there are very good sources of information in these things. What we have to do is learn 
the same thing we've had to learn with every other element of modernity. Um, eating right will actually make you feel better, but it takes a little while before you feel that. The expediency is the thing that we have to uh, we have to overlook. We have to overlook the 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 quick pleasure for the later on the good real good that we're going to get. Same thing with exercise, right? You have to overlook the soreness and you know the struggle um, to have you know to to be able to get those endorphins that 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 really good comfortable feeling that we feel in our bodies when we exercise regularly but it takes a little longer right we have to be able to learn to be patient it's the same thing with with our information problem now we have to say okay i could look at the infinite memes about you know will smith slapping chris rock or whatever which hey i'm okay with memes and there's there's we still have to get have, allow ourselves some ice cream and chocolate cake we still have to allow ourselves rest days okay there's still that because we're humans and we deserve a little bit of life you know a little bit of variety but ultimately i'm going to feel so much better about the time that i spent reading an article that had real science in it that it that enriched my life I'm going to feel so much better listening to a podcast that discusses real issues other and, and not some, you know, doom scrolling half hour fest of just TikTokers who are, you know, lighting stuff on fire and, you know, I don't know what they do. Um, so so it, it'll come down to we have to reorganize our palate for information and we have to. We, it all comes down to that delayed gratification and we have to have faith that it will happen, but we, but finding that thing that is worth listening to and, you know, the, the option of just flipping on TikTok, we have to overcome that expediency, that, that urge and drive for expediency for, for a, a better outcome, which will come with quality. Yeah. Cause I think. Now I'm trying to sort of bring together the sort of metaphors and the similarities between fast food and hunting your meal, hunt what you eat. Um, yeah. TikTok and YouTube, you're getting so much content so fast, whereas compared to reading a book, it's really slow and steady. So if I'm thinking, okay, if someone eats a lot and they eat a lot of fast food, they get obese. So I guess that's sort of why people's minds sort of explode when they're sort of just taking too much content and there's probably health effects that we haven't um, researched and looked into because people were not made to consume that much content in such 20 second periods. Oh my God. And if you think about when it comes to processed foods and fast foods, your body will actually, it doesn't satiate your hunger, right? Your body's actually looking for nutrition and it says, well, I just ate a bunch of calories, but I didn't get any minerals. I didn't get any vitamins. I didn't get any, you know, any phytonutrients or anything like that. I better eat a whole lot more because apparently I have to eat large sums of, of food in order to get, you know, decent amount of, of calories. However, have you ever tried to get full? Have you ever tried to overeat almonds? No. <laughs> it's you. Oh my God. You eat like 10 almonds and you're like, Oh man, I'm full. And it's just, all I've done is eaten a handful of almonds. As opposed to, you know, a cheeseburger or something like that. It's really kind of incredible. I, I, I recommend trying it. It's the same way. Just think about how quickly your brain gets tired after reading something that's very high level academic versus doom scrolling on the internet, right? It's the same basic principle. How is it that information, you know, you can have 30 minutes of information that is just mindless and it does nothing for you. You, feel, you still feel the urge to continue to go on as opposed to reading some kind of, you know, you know, treatise on literature or something like that. It's like, man, after 30 minutes, I'm like, I feel like I actually did something. You know, there's, there's, it, we have to relearn how we satisfy that urge. And then what I'm sort of thinking is fast food is really nice because you're sort of putting all the nice foods into like a condensed sort of palette. And that's sort of what TikTok is. It's sort of giving you all the golden nuggets. Whereas when you're reading a book, you're sort of having to dig and find those golden nuggets. You're sort of following along in the journey. And it sort of gives you a lot of this sort of bread in between that sort of 
it's like a more healthy meal when you're reading a book, I guess. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that's, that's, I like that. How you put that very well. I think that's good. One thing that I, I really um, sort of notice, you bring up a lot of philosophy. And then, and I sort of really do sort of um, sense this sort of, you sort of do come off as like a bigger sort of a, a manly man with the beard, but you have this sort of kind soul um, within you, Jesse. And, and you even talked about, you know, spending time on figuring yourself out. Um, and I want to hear about, about this side of you, like the philosophy, the journey to find yourself and this kind soul you have. Well, this is what I do with my retreats. So, so breath work is something that uh, my colleague James Stewart and I, we, we do a lot of retreats. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of things coming up. Ultimately, breath work it can be a lot of things. One thing, of course, when we talk about cold showers or when we talk about eating right, we talk about, you know, those things are, are a lot of times we get into them because of the surface level things. Well, the science says that I will be able to perform better. I'll be able to focus better. Great. I'll be able to not be as anxious. Well, that's awesome. That's a fantastic thing. Just that by itself is worth doing it. But then you have, then eventually you start thinking, well, why am I here anyway? Right. And, and what am I here to do? What, what's my purpose? And, and not to mention what's been holding me back from the things that I want to get out of this life, because man, you know, uh, now that I'm starting to, to take hold and, and starting to learn how to trust this physiology that I have, well, um, what am I capable of? What, what am I here to do? And so this is something that actually, you know, I, I started early on enjoying philosophy uh, and, and that's why I became a professor. So, so I, I've, I've been a university professor for 10 years. Um, or I guess this is my 11th year. Time flies. So, <laughs> so yeah, so, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, my, my love has always been ideas and trying to figure yourself out and, and what what breath work really has been for me is a tool to help a person and, and first of all myself and then now that it's really helped me i, I wanted to go out there and, and help every, everybody i can but help us learn to examine who we are and when i say awareness is the foundation of all positive change you know it, it really this is so important to think about what awareness is awareness is honesty you know if i if i were to say you know um oh, i'm fine i'm fine whenever i'm freaking out that's being dishonest and, and you're only going to suffer if you're dishonest with yourself and 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 so the same can be said okay maybe uh, maybe i'm i feel bad about myself or maybe there's changes in my life i know i need to make it all kind of blends together it's all part of this human experience. And so um, philosophically, I, I've been a, uh, a fan of existentialism and uh, stoicism. Those are two really amazing schools of, of philosophy. Um, uh, Kierkegaard and uh, Camus have, have been big influences on me as well as some of Nietzsche. Um, but, uh, but ultimately the experience I've had has been an existential experience. I have literally decided to become a different person. And while um, and while there's still parts of me that are the same, what I've learned is that um, there are a million different pieces of, of, of us. And there's a part of me that is the part of me that now says, Jesse, if you don't get into that gym, you're gonna feel like crap. And there, there that part of me was, it had to be birthed okay and this is getting a little philosophical now but i had to birth that part of me and birthing is uh i mean i have never given birth before but it seems as though it looks like it's pretty uncomfortable right uh it seems as though you know people uh, women when they give birth uh it's a, it's a painful process but it's a worthwhile process and it brings something new and living into the world that is beautiful and so that is something that you know that that's how it worked for me to become the person that i wanted to be i knew that i could be okay i, I at least had to believe and that's the only you know, 
the only th the only thing I really had going for me, I guess, even though I, I ran away from every discomfort, is that I believe that man, if I if I tried, maybe I could be something better. Maybe I could be more of what I want to be. And so, what I help people do, and if you go to like, for instance, I'm doing a retreat. Uh, of course, all of mine are in the states, um, except for I, I have one in Playa del Carmen, that's Mexico. So it's it's still on this hemisphere, but. Um, but a lot of retreats, I'll begin with a funeral ceremony and it literally is, okay, there's a part of you that needs to die. So this new part of you can be born. And what I see so often and and whether it's people recovering from addictions or whether it's a person who's made mistakes and they don't want to make mistakes anymore. So often we identify with the mistakes we've made. I am a former, you know, a recovering addict or I am a person who is codependent or I always choose the wrong kind of girlfriend or boyfriend and we start to identify with that and that's just as you know it makes us suffer just as much as if we were still doing those things I in my opinion so what I say is that we have to we have to let a part of us that we sometimes we have to let a part of us die in order for a part of us to be born now to kill a part of us, that part of us wants to stay alive and it's difficult. It's really hard. And so what breath work allows us to do is it allows us to live in that moment, that awareness. I was talking about that full awareness. And it's a great way to practice that self honesty and that self awareness so that we can say, okay, am I, am I hanging on to this part of me that I need to die? Right? This part of me is not serving me anymore. It is not who I want to be. It's not who I really know that I could be. And am I going to hang on to that or can I let it go so that I can pick up this new part of me and, and let this new part of me be born? And literally, let's see, actually in May, I'll be doing a, uh, a retreat for its first responder. So it's, it's not for you know, probably anybody listening to this, but it's for only like police officers, EMTs and this, especially in police here in the United States, there's a very high suicide rate, right? And which is especially disturbing because to get that job, they have to pass a psychological exam, right? So we know that they go into it psychologically sound. And so what I, what I do is, you know, we're, we're going to go out and we're going to use breath work as a tool to allow us to become more honest with ourselves, to, to engender that awareness and as a tool to help us downregulate if we need to downregulate, you know, so that we can start to say, okay, who do I really want to be? You know, and, and I always say, you know, in the, in the modern age, we have, I think, well-meaning people who will give the advice, hey, you're perfect just the way you are. You know, there's songs out there like that, right? And I think it's very well-meaning advice and it sounds good and it, boy, it feels good too. But I don't say that. I, I say, you're worth working on. You know, if, if I almost feel like it would be depressing if I was completely done working on myself, if you're perfect, where, where do you have left to go? So ultimately when it comes down to it, when you, when I, when I do retreats, when I work with people, yes, I train breath work, but we, when we train a person, we also look at the whole person, I think. And, uh, and that's, that's the school of thought. That's, that's where I come from philosophically. I love how you sort of tied breath work to sort of finding yourself. Cause I do feel like when you sort of take a deep breath and you sort of calm down, you're sort of like the sort of truest version of yourself. It's sort of similar to when, I don't know, you're getting high um, and you're doing weed and, and it peels all these layers of the onions and you sort of end up the most natural form of yourself. And then when you sort of talked about having to rebirth yourself, I do feel like when I do take a deep breath and I do settle into myself, that's me taking one step towards me being the, me being the best version of myself. And every time I say, hang out with some old high school friends and I forget to breathe and, and I'm starting to talk like I used to, then I'm taking a step backwards away from what I like. And the goal is to keep taking steps um, towards the best version of yourself and taking deep breaths and, and settling in yourself. It's, it's crazy how, yeah, we, we've combined the f journey to finding yourself with the breathing. Yeah, it's just how it works. It, it's how it's worked for me. And 
it's uh it's what i it's what i think that the ultimate my ultimate goal is uh with breath work yes i work with athletes i work with all sorts of people to improve their physiological uh, abilities but uh but ultimately we we try when we when i train people in breath work uh, i look at the full person the whole person that's there this has been an amazing chat. I really appreciate your time today, Jesse. Where can people find more about what you do and the upcoming events and sort of your program? Um, plug everything. Hey, great. So uh, you can always find everything that I'm doing right now on jessecoomer.com. That's J-E-S-S-E-C-O-O-M-E-R.com. And it's in the description uh, and in your, uh, com- your uh, show notes. Um, in there, you can sign up for my, my email and I don't spam people. I promise I actually have to write those things. So uh, I usually only send out one or two per month, just letting you know where I am, what I'm doing, what opportunities are out there. My book is a practical guide to breath work, and that's available on audible and on, um, ebook and paperback at amazon.com. You can also find it on my website at jessicoomer.com. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel, which is Jesse Coomer on YouTube and you just search Jesse Coomer. I'll pop up. You'll see a big bearded smiling guy and it'll be me. Uh, and then also you can find me on Instagram. Don't doom scroll all day, but uh, if you'd like to follow me and, and find out what I'm doing on Instagram, it is at Jesse Coomer breath. And uh, you can always reach out to me via jessecoomer.com. I do speaking and, uh, uh, workshops, retreats, engagements all over the world. And uh, I'd be happy to train people also uh, face-to-face. Uh, so all those, all that information is available for you on my website. Beautiful. We'll link everything below. I really appreciate your time today, Jesse. I just love your sort of passion. This is something that you're definitely passionate about. You really have this sort of pure ambition to sort of help as many people as possible. I do think you have this unique story on, on how you are able to sort of switch and then that's going to relate with a lot of people and, and you have this sort of egoless sort of kind soul where, where you, you, there's no front and you're sort of on this journey to then help other people to get to that same place and, and I um, love the energy that I'm getting from you and I appreciate your time today Jesse. Thanks so much for having me. I really, really have had a good time. It's been a great chat. Awesome. So I hope you guys had an amazing time listening to this episode. I really appreciate your time and we'll see you guys next week. Peace.